In this video you will learn how to use a battery of four Sturm Tigers, or more correctly Sturm Mörser, assault mortar. This video is based on a document from February 1945 with the title Guidelines for the Usage of the Assault Mortar Battery 38cm RW. Something I stumbled across while visiting the German military archive, which was made possible by my supporters on Patreon, Subscribestar and YouTube. Thank you guys. So let's look at the interesting parts and add some additional context. But the basics first. The assault mortar is a self-propelled artillery vehicle on the chassis of the Tiger I with a 38cm rocket launcher. Note that it is called Sturmmörser assault mortar. This continues throughout the document. The term Sturmtiger is never used. Now if you look at the Sturmtiger next to the Königstiger, you might actually think it was based on the King Tiger chassis due to the similarity in the track wheels, but the Sturm Tiger was converted from late war Tiger 1s that were set back from the front for repairs and had different track wheels than the early variants we usually see. Basically the turret was removed and the casemate added. As you can see the frontal armor plate is now sloped, additionally it had a thickness of 150mm instead of the about 100mm of the regular Tiger 1. Furthermore, the top armor on the casement was quite strong with up to 40mm compared to the maximum of 26mm in the Tiger 1. This means the armor values for the Sturm Tiger casemate were the same as for the Königs Tiger's superstructure. As such, the document contains an error since it notes armor like Tiger. Let's hope this is the only error. Technically, it is correct for the chassis on the side, except for the front. Yet it is clearly wrong for the casemate. Now due to the increased armor and ammunition loadout, the total weight had increased to 65 tons according to the document, which is about 5 tons heavier than the Tiger 1 and just 3 tons short to the weight of the Königstiger. It is noted, the gun is more sluggish than the Tiger due to its size and heavy weight of ammunition. Next is the maximum firing range. This information is far more precise than anything I could find in secondary sources. Maximum range 5500 meters at plus 10 degrees Celsius. This is interesting because depending on the source, the range is usually given between 4.6 to 6 kilometers and without any temperature. Furthermore, it is noted how much dispersion a shot had at a range of 5000 meters. Dispersions 50% length dispersion at 5000 meters, 167 meters. 50% width dispersion at 5000 meters, 59 meters. Now this means that 50% of all shots landed in an area of 167 meters times 59 meters. According to the document this is rather high. Sadly I could not find any information on the dispersion of German artillery pieces in my books or primary sources. The rate of fire is also given and let's say it takes a while till the kitty roars. Which is not so unsurprising if you look at the shells which weighed almost 350 kilograms. Rate of fire about 4 shots per hour. To put this in context, a draft of the armor regulation on the command of the artillery from 1937 gives the maximum rate of fire for several weapons. The light field howitzer 105mm with 180 to 220 shots per hour. The heavy field howitzer 150mm with 100 to 120 shots per hour. Yet the numbers are preceded by this note. The following maximum fire rate per gun must not be exceeded in order to protect the equipment. So in other words, they likely could have fired faster, whereas the Sturm Tiger was severely limited by the cumbersome reloading procedure to do the shell weight. Similar to regular artillery, the Sturm Tiger could be used in direct and indirect fire. For indirect fire, the scissors telescope is used. For direct fire, the Navy anti-tank gun sight, C-42. Now you're probably going to ask, why is the Sturm Tiger equipped with an anti-tank gun sight from the Kriegsmarine? Well, the reason is rather simple and still odd. Originally, a 38cm rocket launch and the Sturm Tiger was developed by the Kriegsmarine as a coastal anti-submarine weapon. From what we know, it had little to no operational success. Yet at one point, the weapon was chosen for the Sturm Tiger due to its large warhead. Speaking of the warhead, the document notes about the ammunition. 38cm the Raketensprenggranate 4581 with propellant drive. Shell weight 345 kilograms. 
Now the total weight of the warhead was 125 kilograms, which is quite substantial for an artillery piece. In comparison, a 15 cm Nebelwerfer 41 had a warhead of 2.4 kilograms, or the 21 cm Nebelwerfer 42 had 10.2 kilograms. Whereas the standard heavy artillery for the German infantry divisions, namely the Schwere Feldhobitze 18, had a warhead of 5.1 kilograms. As you can see, the Sturmtiger packed quite a lot of punch, although the number of punches was quite low. First ammunition loadout, 22 rounds per barrel, 12 rounds in the gun. Fragmentation and moral effect by detonation and air pressure are large. Now some of you might know that the Sturmtiger was mainly used on the Western Front. This might be related to the following line. Firing at temperatures below minus 15 degrees Celsius doesn't promise a worthwhile effect, as the dispersion becomes too large. Still, the Sturmtiger saw action during the Battle of the Barge, which lasted from December 1944 to January 1945. Yet since the document was written in February 1945, it might be that this information was deducted from the operation. It should be added here that some books note that in 1945 hollow charge ammunition was introduced as well, yet that it likely never saw action. In 1945 a hollow charge shell was introduced under number 4592, which was available as KM-10 for Kriegsmarine launchers. It could penetrate 2.5 meters of reinforced concrete. Of the normal Raketensprenggranate 4581, 1400 were ordered. The weapons office accepted 397 pieces. The troops received 317. The guidelines only refer to the 38 cm Raketensprenggranate and make no mention of the hollow charge rocket. Additionally, considering that only 317 shots of the original ammunition were issued to the troops in total, this means on average only 17.6 shots per kitty, so less than a full ammo loadout according to the document. We can assume that if any hollow charge M was issued to the troops, it was very likely in extremely low quantities. Now in terms of organization, a Sturmmörser battery consists of four Sturmtiger, one artillery observation half-track, namely the Sonderkraftfahrzeug 251-18, 11 trucks, four cars and five motorcycles. This equipment was handled by a total of 78 men, namely four officers, 31 NCOs and 43 enlisted men, which were equipped with 33 rifles, 20 pistols, 17 submachine guns and 5 light machine guns. Finally, it is important to note that originally the Sturmtigers were organized in companies. Why you ask? Well, initially they were part of the Panzer Arm and only in January 1945 they were transferred to the Artillery Arm, which names its companies batteries. Something that can be quite confusing because sometimes you hear of companies and other times of batteries. Now since we got the basics covered, we can now move to the employment part of the guidelines. A. The assault motor batteries are a distinct center of gravity weapon of the higher command. The employment takes place on suggestion of the higher artillery commander. Assault motor batteries are to be used as a whole against decisive and worthwhile targets. Combining several batteries in centers of gravity leads to the complete smashing of even resistant targets. Surprising operation increases the effect. Now Schwerpunkt is often translated as center of gravity or a decision point. In a way both might be correct, since Sabecki and Condell point out in their translation of the key document on the German doctrine, Truppenführung, Troop Command, that the book uses Schwerpunkt for both concepts interchangeably. If you wonder what higher command refers to, this should be an army or corps command, according to an army regulation of 1937. Now usually an army would contain up to 250,000 men and a corps at least 40,000 men. Although by 1945 these numbers might be a bit lower. I guess it is not particularly surprising that these kiddies were only available to the high ups, since in total only 18 Sturm Tigers were converted from the Tiger I. Now to be a bit more specific, some data on the concentration of fire. Point E later notes, the fire of all barrels must be thereupon be held together in a confined space. Spreading the battery over more than 600 meter front width fragments the effect and has to be omitted. Point B talks about the Sturmtiger in combination with the artillery. B. Assault mortar batteries are excellent for reinforcing the fire effect of combined artillery. 
Due to the large dispersion, assault mortars should only be used for extended area targets, deployments, assemblies, cities, larger bases of operations. The small rate of fire is to be balanced by combining numerous assault mortars on one target. Remember, a Sturmtiger can only fire around 4 shots per hour. The next point is about concealment. C. Assault mortar batteries are generally used far forward because of their limited fire range. In spite of their strong armor, they go into concealed firing position as far as the characteristics of the target and the ballistic performance allow. In addition, they are able to engage in attacks with tanks or assault guns in the second wave and under the protection of these, engage decisive targets with direct fire. You can clearly tell that an artilleryman wrote this, since he refers to 5500 meters as limited range. Concealing the position of the Sturm Tiger was crucial, since it had one major issue, namely that the propellant gas was blown out at the front of the bell. This is the reason for the small holes in the bell. This was done to reduce recoil, yet the side effect was that there was a lot of smoke generated, which means the Sturm Tiger could be easily spotted. Let's move to the next point. D. The use of single self-propelled artillery vehicles as assault guns may be an exception in special situations. For instance, in urban or fortress combat. In this case, tanks or assault guns, as well as escorting infantry, must be provided. This employment is the exception and may only be used for limited combat tasks. Monitoring by heavy weapons and artillery is necessary to protect the valuable equipment. Not much to add here besides the general note that through a German doctrine, it is always noted not to use tanks or assault guns alone. See for instance my Panzer Tactics video. The next part is about the various preparations that are necessary before a battery could be used. H. Every use of an assault motor battery must be thoroughly prepared. The use of these valuable vehicles and ammunition can only be justified if the target is worth the effort. The appearance of fire and smoke requires full visual cover and a concealed fire position. The camouflage against air reconnaissance and noise camouflage when going into position is of particular importance. The weight of the assault mortar forces to scout the approach route and to reinforce bridges in time. In the firing position, all preparations must be made in such a way that the fire can be opened immediately when the gun has moved into position. To protect the vehicle against air attacks, anti-aircraft guns shall be used. Unsurprisingly, the Sturm Tiger was a rather clumsy weapon that required a lot of preparation to use properly. Now there's also a short section on special aspects, which are quite interesting. A. As far as the combat situation permits, the ammunition shall be brought to the firing position. The practice of returning, like done with the assault guns, shall be avoided because of the high fuel consumption. As mentioned, a Sturm Tiger was issued 22 shots, but could only carry about 12 to 14 shots at a time. Now considering that reloading took a lot of time and due to the smoke and sound, the firing positions were rather well exposed. The next one won't surprise my regular viewers. B. Maintaining the operational readiness of the valuable vehicles is decisively dependent on the existence of a Tiger workshop. When in use, the assault motor battery is dependent on such a workshop. As always, the dreaded L word is very important, namely logistics. And speaking of maintenance, just last week I released a video on Soviet tank repair in World War II on my second channel, which comes with some nice footage from three different museums. You might want to check it out. Of course, the other typical Tiger problems are mentioned as well, namely that C. Towing of an assault mortar requires the use of at least one 18-ton tow half-track. And, and D. Special wagons and loading tracks are required for rail transport. Note the Sims were special flat cars. Well, my friend, the next time when you command a German army or corps and you stumble across a battery of Sturmtigers, you know how to use them properly. And if you learn anything new, remember, experience and suggestions for employment, organization and equipment shall be submitted at short notice after each operation, with a copy directly to the channel of the artillery in the Army High Command and a copy via the chain of command. Big thank you here to the Panzer Museum Munster for inviting me in 2018 and 2019. Also a big thank you to Jack for pointing out the important errors in the early access version and Roman Töppel for helping out with some Wehrmacht abbreviations.
If you want to see more content from archives and museum, consider supporting me on Patreon, Subscriptor or Alternatives, linked in the description. Ezra, the sources. Thank you for watching and see you next time.